before we're not going to uh, I'm not going to do this every week, but I'm sort of alternating it in between the other pastors preaching because uh, there's an awful lot of background I'm trying to pick up as I go along, and I need a little bit more time in between. Uh, our text is based upon, if you'll turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. I'll keep reading this passage of Scripture many times uh, and pray that the Holy Spirit will minister this word to our heart and we'll be better, better able to uh, comprehend uh, these things of the human misery and the sovereignty of God. So, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to Sheol and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifted up the beggar from the refuge to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. Uh, I've drawn this chart, just before I begin, I'm going to close the story man. I just wanted to, uh, I've drawn this chart, Mike has drawn the chart, praise the Lord. And I just devised this chart, and I'm going to put this up here a few times also during the course of the studies because I just want you to get the idea of something here. God, represented up here, is God's foreknowledge, seeing the beginning and the end. He sees the completion of everything a person will do. He also sees the completion of the beginning of the end of everything he's going to do, as far as time is concerned. There is no beginning or end with God or his works, but as far as time limited to this planet is concerned. Now, I've drawn the solid line to show that that is what is. And God sees the beginning and he sees the end of any matter, individual or collective. And I've drawn these broken lines, and broke, these solid lines represent the various events in a person's life. Birth, go to school, marriage, whatever, even the big ones and the small ones. I couldn't draw them all because there'd be millions of them. But let these represent the person's successive stages or events in his life. The broken lines represent what God sees could have been. And these broken lines represent what could have been with the individual. Now it sounds confusing right now, but as we go on, this chart's going to make more and more sense. And what we're trying to say by this chart is that God and his sovereignty knows what is going to happen from the beginning to the end. But it did not have to be that way necessarily. We have a free will, and God did not tamper with that free will. And so there are things that could have been that were not simply because of our free will. But God also knew that. But it did not necessarily have to be that way. So I know that might sound a little confusing right now, but as we progress into this, not this morning necessarily, but in the future, uh, I'm hoping that this is, nothing is ever adequate to describe God's uh, attributes, but it'll help. We progress now to the point in our groundwork, our introduction, which this morning will be the last part of the introduction, where we can begin to get more specific with the question of the limitation of Satan's dominion over earth, which when established, we will move on to the main body of the study, which will, which will try to bring some understanding concerning the problem of human misery and God's sovereignty. In our last session, we studied the fall of Satan, the creation of man and his fall. We saw that it was the intention of God that man should be sovereign and master of the earth. He was created with an almost unlimited capacity for knowledge and understanding concerning the universe in which he lived. Now this chart is also representative of that. God had intended for Adam and Eve a certain uh, atmosphere, a certain, they were, had an unlimited capacity to have joy and happiness and to master this human, uh, human life and the planet Earth and everything around it. But they did not attain to that. So God knew the beginning from the end, and this is what could have been, 
or I'm sorry, this is what could have been, but this is what was. Now, man, you see, I was uh, on vacation this week a little, and I went down to Syracuse, and as I was driving on the throughway, it was, pale, it was a little warm, and uh, many, many cars. It was just beautiful weather, and people were traveling. There was trucks, and I'm thinking, here we are sitting in this thing, and we're going along about 55 miles an hour, and uh, this machine is taking us someplace. Where years ago, I was thinking, we're talking about it, it was an old wagon trail. The New York State Thruway was once an Indian trail from New York to Buffalo, and that's, how, that's why it's so windy and everything. Now, modern science today can make a, we can make a straight thing right from here to New York and cut off a lot of mileage. But this was, this was an old Indian trail. And so covered wagons began to follow it, and settlers began to follow it, and they simply made roads out of it. And the New York State just simply made, you know, just paved that, and that was already, the trails were already cut over the rivers and so forth. It was the best way to go. The whole point of it was, is I looked around and I'm thinking of man's knowledge and technology. But do you know it don't amount to that of what could have been? Do you realize with our mental powers, had we allowed that not men had not fallen, that we probably could have transported ourselves from one place to the other with just mental power? There is no limitation to what God would have allowed man to attain on planet Earth if it was within the confines of God's will. Man would have had a communication with the animals. Kevin was uh, saying something last night as he saw this thing about uh, how they were, uh, they had these animals, these walruses and everything, and how they were communicating with them in love. I mean, not talking with them, but that they had a real rapport between the animals and the man. And the animals were doing incredible things just to please man. This is what God had originally designed for the world. There were, we would have had lions laying down at our feet, and they would have been like little kittens, and they would have done everything to please man. Because man was to unlock, the, unlock all, the, all the secrets of this universe that God has, man was to unlock. He was capable of doing it. Our minds are puny right now. Our minds are decap... decap uh, uh, de I'm trying to find the word. Uh, it doesn't have the capacity now that it was originally intended to have. And why? Because of the fall. Due to man's rebellion against his God, he was ruined. And that's the word the Hebrew scripture says when man fell, he was ruined. Not destroyed utterly where he was non-existent, but he was put in a lower plateau. He was incapacitated, that's the word I was trying to say. Where once man was to have an unlimited capacity for knowledge and understanding of his universe, now because of the darkness of what happened when he fell from his holiness of God, he was now incapacitated and he was completely ruined, and he will never in this body attain to that which God had originally designed. The scepter of the kingdom of earth, which was rightfully man's, God had handed man, if you were, the key to the universe and said, here it is. Now, man didn't have it all in the garden. He was going to attain to it. And this would have been pleasure and exciting. And it would have been a great thing. Just stop and think. If little by little, throughout the aeons of time, that you would be unlocking the secrets of the universe, the true secrets, the truth, not false. This is what God had for man, and he gave him the key and the scepter. But what happened? Because of man's rebellion against God, self-centeredness and sinfulness, Satan was allowed to wrest this scepter from man and claim it as his own, and rightfully so. Before we proceed any further, let me dispel from your thinking once again any notion that God and Satan are battling over mastery for the planet Earth to see and determine who will rule supreme. Remember we talked about dualism and that was their theory? Satan rules completely the planet Earth without a shadow of a doubt. He does not share the rule of planet Earth with man, and he does not share the rule of planet Earth with God. That sounds astounding, but it's a scriptural fact, and I'll prove it. You might as well get it settled in your head right now. The ruler of this planet is Satan himself and his minions or his angels or his demons, not God and not man. Turn with me, if you will, to John 12, 31. Gospel of John, chapter 12, and verse 31. 
I'm just going to read a few scriptures which I'll explain later on down the road, but we'll just read them now. Now is the judgment of this cosmos or world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Speaking of Satan, the prince, the ruler of this world be cast out. Ephesians 2.2. 2. In which in times past ye walked according to the course of this cosmos, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience. Okay? And 2 Corinthians 4, 4. There are literally scores of passages of scripture to substantiate this. I just picked a handful. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 in whom the God of this age has blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now I shall explain this a little later on about Satan being complete ruler of the, of the planet Earth. Uh, I just wanted to give a couple of scriptures to substantiate that. Much will be gained from an understanding of the word itself, cosmos, which is used in the Greek scriptures uh, this is what comes from the Greek scriptures. It is used 187 times in the New Testament, and it's always translated by the English word world, except in one instance, which I don't know what that one scripture was. I don't know if Steve you got a chance to look at it. Okay. But that word that you see in the English Bible translated world is the word cosmos, and it's used 187 times in the Greek New Testament. Only one time it's not translated world. Now, there are two other Greek words also translated world, but one means time frame or age, which is aeon, and the other means an inhabited district. So them words have no bearing on what we're bringing about now. But cosmos is the word that's used for this world in the Greek New Testament. Cosmos, the word, developed etymologically or from its root from the concept of order or arrangement. That's what it originally meant. It was the opposite of chaos. So it means arrangement is order or, or, or um, ornamentation. It was the opposite thought of, cosm or of chaos. But the word developed, and it, the New Testament took this word and gave it a theological meaning, and the word in the Greek New Testament means the anti-God order in which we now live in. This is what this word developed from. Now, not, there's many words have developed and changed its way in meaning and so forth. It originally meant one thing in its, in its, in its, um, if it, in its infancy or in its inception, and the word began to get used to mean different things later on down the road. And we all were, were fully aware that the English language has developed many things like that also. And this is one word just like the word baptism that developed and gave it and he took on a christianized meaning <laughs> baptism was never a theological term it was a greek word used every day but when it was incorporated into the new testament it was given a theological meaning so the word cosmos as we study it in it, every place where it's used you'll come to understand what this word represents the word is used to mean in the New Testament the anti-God system in which we now live. It incorporates the material things of planet Earth, such as vegetation, water, minerals, and animals, the material things of planet Earth, such as vegetation, water, minerals, and animal forms, because it's on this Earth. But its true or primary concept is that which deals with the intangibles of planet Earth. Governments, educational systems and institutions, military and the sciences. It is really better described as the mindset of this universe or influence or the motivating force of our planet. Let me give you an example if I could. It's a, it's a poor one, but nonetheless. It would be like a Rolls Royce car, which is a beautiful machine, highly precision, top of the line, the best quality that there could be. Now that machine was designed for a uh, specific function. 
It's a high quality car used for touring and used in its proper way. That car is, is just a marvel to behold how it runs and, and everything else. And I'm not mechanically inclined, but some of you that know about mechanics, I'm sure you'll agree that a Rolls Royce, the old Rolls Royces that they made were really works of perfection. They were beautiful cars. Now, that car was meant for a specific thing, and they had men trained in England how to drive these cars. They knew about the history of the car. They studied this car. They almost went to school about this car, and these men became chauffeurs. And these chauffeurs, or chauffeurs, I don't really want to say it, knew this car and how to drive it and how to get the maximum of everything out of it in comfort, speed, and everything else. So these trained chauffeurs would get into this car, and it was just like poetry in motion. The man who was trained how to drive this car and this machine, and together they made a beautiful uh, situation, a beautiful experience. Now take this same beautiful Rolls Royce, this precision machinery, and get some piston jackie in there. Jump behind the wheel, and off he goes, <laughs> right? Corner around this way and hitting the bumps and everything else, trying to spin his wheels, and you got a little idea of what it was like, what the planet Earth is like under this present cosmos. It was designed for one thing, but a piston jackie got behind the controls of planet Earth. And now he's twisting it and contorting it to do all kinds of things it was never designed to do at his whim and pleasure and at the ruination of this precision machinery which he don't even care about nor appreciates nor even understands. And this is a small example of what's happening on this planet Earth right now. <clears throat> he took the wheel. Let us look at some scriptures depicting what that word entails. Let's turn to John again, the Gospel of John chapter 12 and verse 46. And if you understand this word cosmos, it's going to give you a great understanding of Satan and the influence of him and his limitations upon this planet. That word alone will enlighten you. John chapter 12 and verse 46. I am come a light into the cosmos, that whosoever believeth in me should not abide in darkness. Now I'd like to ask you a question. You can answer in your own, own mind's eye. This is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I am come a light into the world or a light into the cosmos. My goodness, I didn't know that we were in darkness. There's no sun out there. There's no electric light bulbs. There's no lanterns or nothing like that. Did he mean that he's come a physical light into the world just to give us the sun and the moon and the stars? Of course not. I mean, it's ridiculous that any child could understand that. The sun is here. He's not talking about he came into the world or into this cosmos to bring light into this cosmos. This cosmos already has got light or luminaries that can show us our way with our eyes. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I've come into this cosmos to bring light. Let's read this again. Verse 46. I am come a light into the cosmos, that whosoever believeth in me should not abide in darkness. This entire cosmos or world is in darkness, spiritual darkness. Entirely, completely permeates every facet of this complete cosmos. And there is no sense of you thinking that there's some enlightenment here, there's some good, or there's some spiritual truth. The systems of this world are completely dark, totally dark. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am come to bring some spiritual light into this dark, dismal cosmos. So you see that what, what he's talking about here has nothing to do with physical light. He's talking to do, uh, it, it's talking about spiritual enlightenment. Now I want to give you an example of this. This magazine, I was just picked up this week from my father, uh, Newsweek. It's April's edition. You see here are two men, aren't they cute? Rubbing their bellies together in the gay district somewhere in California. They're gays, they're homosexuals. And this is what this article talks about. I'll just read you part of it. The four young men sat in the semi-darkness of the deserted ward waiting for the weekend shot of interferon at New York's Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. They tried not to look at the fifth man, the law professor, 
His face was swollen and disfigured by purplish Kaposi sarcoma, KS, lesions. His frail body, racked for months by pneumonia and other often recurring infections, weighed no more than a, he weighed no more than a child. He was beyond hope, beyond terror. They fought not to see their fate in his, and again they fought the old fears and doubts. Their lifestyle was not sinful. AIDS was not a gay plague sent down upon them. God doesn't do things like this, said Alan, a quiet southerner who works in a bank and sings in a church choir. I'm not being punished for anything. It's bad luck or fate or something I have done that has caused this to happen. None of these things. This nightmare rumors that swirled through the homosexual communities of New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles almost three years ago had become cruel fact. It's not my sinful life that's done this, says the choir boy, who's a gay, as he looks upon these people with these things. It's not a plague sent down from heaven or bad luck or anything like that. Well, what, pray tell, is it? Now, what I'm, I'm not trying to mock these people out. I feel sorry for them. What I'm trying to point out to you is, do you see the attitude? They are in such gross darkness that they think that their illicit sex affairs are nothing sinful. I marvel at the fact that they even recognize such a concept as the word sinful. How can a person be so darkened not to understand these things? which is basic nature. I don't buy it. I don't buy it for one minute that they don't understand that it's sinful. Because if they don't understand that it's sinful, then the Spirit of God has not done his job. The reason they don't understand it's sinful is their conscience is so seared by Satan and what they've allowed, and they've been in this dark cosmos for so long without being willing to let the Spirit of the light of Christ in them that now their conscience is seared and they'll call anything right. Abortions today, all in the best interest of humanity. This is an example of what I'm talking about when I say a dark cosmos. Now, I was interested to find another article in another magazine, and I'll start off reading the main caption. All the evils of the world have fallen prey to the most powerful of scientific weapons explanation. Just think about that. This is written from a non-believer. At least I think he's a non-believer by the way he talks. But his understanding of what's happening in the world is marvelous. And let me read a couple of things what he says. He's talking about all the things that science just explains away. Rage. If a drunk driver kills my wife, how dare I hate him? We all know alcoholism is a disease and no one gets a disease on purpose. But if I do hate him, if I'm out of my mind with rage and kill the driver, you can't be angry with me. After all, wasn't I suffer suffering from temporary insanity? That's a brief disease like the flu he's got in parentheses. <laughs> now don't worry, if you find yourself angry with your spouse or boss, you just have an emotional problem. Eating too much, that's okay, you're simply suffering from obesity. Certainly you needn't concern yourself with any lack of willpower. As we have all learned, your food problem is really just repressed sexuality. Or maybe you don't have enough pineapple in your diet. Well, maybe the problem isn't perfectly clear, but some book with a new theory and certainly a new word for the problem will explain it all shortly. The one thing that is clear is that the problem isn't your fault and the solution could never be as simple as just stop eating so much. Do you find yourself lacking energy? Are you accomplishing less than others think you should? Could you be suffering from the 19th century imperfection called laziness? Not a chance. You've probably got hypoglycemia, the most deadly epidemic since the plague. Are you bored with work? You probably suffer from burnout, one of the newest pet diseases of the middle class. Remember the old days when you thought they called it work because it was difficult, unpleasant, and boring? Remember when you believed the reason you were being paid was to do your job, whether you liked it or not? Those days are over. Then he goes on and on and on. This man's insight is marvelous. I mean, it really is. I'm, I'm, I really credit the person. Now, you see what's happening in the world? Man has explained away every principle and every morality that there is. Now, it took time, and it's going to take a little bit more time, but Satan started at the beginning, and he began to do this with mankind, and one time he was so successful, how many people were left on the face of the earth after God's wrath was poured out? Eight. 
mankind started all over again and Satan started all over again and now it's almost got to the place again given a few more decades and man's mentality will be right back before the flood or right in Sodom and Gomorrah it's getting there right now and he will think what he's doing is perfectly all right they are ordaining homosexual ministers today they are doing all kinds of atrocities. I know there's a church in Canada that I read about where their communion service consists of everybody stripping naked and touching each other. And they say that's true communion. Now that's disgusting. And you know they think they're doing this in the name of God? And that's not the end of it. It's only the beginning of it. It says, and as the age goes on, evil men and seducers shall wax bolder and bolder, and many more are just going to fall away from all these things. We're in a spiritual, terrible darkness. The cosmos, the system. That's what I want you to understand. There is no light in the world systems. None whatsoever. And don't fool yourself to think there is. It's under the control of Satan also. And we must realize that. Let's look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. <clears throat> the Apostle John says here, And we know that we are of God, and that the whole cosmos lieth in wickedness. Better translated, I'm not saying the King James is wrong, but the, it, it could just as well and should be translated <clears throat> this way and we know that we are of God and the whole cosmos is in the wicked one the picture here is that this whole entire earth or planet and sky and everything that we know is the planet earth is in the bosom of the wicked one it's in Satan's clutches just as if I took one of the little children here and picked them up and put them in my lap and held them that's what this word is speaking of it lieth it's actually in the grip of Satan. The wicked one is Satan. The whole cosmos is in the wicked one. You mean to say that the, the, the medical profession today, the, I'm talking not the nurses and the doctors in it, but the concept of it, the motivating force behind it is in Satan? Yes. Do you mean to say our governmental institutions are in Satan's grip? Yes. Our scientific? Yes. Our educational? Yes. Our military? Yes. Every one of the governmental systems, every system on the face of this earth is in Satan's bosom right now. And you might as well get to accept that and understand it. Does that mean every man, woman, and child in these systems are in it? No. Thank God that that's not the case. I'm not talking about the individuals in it. I'm talking about the processes, the influences, the motivating forces behind it are all, it says here, let me read this again just so you understand. And we know that we are of God, and part of the world lieth in the wicked one. The whole cosmos, entire cosmos, is in the wicked one. It's in his control. James 4.4. 4. Again, you know, just a few to, of, of the many. Again, this is speaking spiritually. He says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the cosmos is what? An enemy of God. You cannot be a friend of the cosmos and be a friend of God. You are an enemy of God. An enemy! Now you say, well, what about a Christian? Well, I don't know what about a Christian. All I'm trying to say here is if you're a friend of God, it says you're an, if you're a friend of the cosmos, you're an enemy of God. Now what does this mean, a friend? It don't mean you, don't, you, you like to see the trees and the birds. It's not talking about that at all. And that's why Christians don't come under this thing. What it's talking about is if you are one of these, if you're a bedfellow with the cosmos, that's exactly what it's talking about. If you're married to it, as opposed to being married to God. That's why he's talking about adultery. It's, it's spiritual. It's unfaithfulness to God. It's breaking the bond of God. And it's simply talking about that if you are a friend of this world, you're an enemy of God. That means if you are really enjoying and loving the systems of this world, it's only because you're an enemy of God. There it is. At this point, it would be well to understand the dual aspect of the will of God, the sovereign and permissive. 
<laughs> okay, I'd like to give you a couple examples that go on, like with this chart I drew for that reason, but I'd like to give you some scriptural examples. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22. Genesis 8 and verse uh, 22. This is an example of the sovereign will of God. While the earth remained at seed time and harvest, and cold and heat and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Do you know of any time that there was none of these things happened? Do you remember a day when the sun didn't shine? Do you remember a time when there was not a winter or a summer? Now I know we said that many times, gee, we didn't even have a summer this year. But do you remember a time when we didn't really have a summer, a spring, winter, or fall? Ever? Did you ever hear of such a time? Has it ever been recorded in the almanacs or history? No. And it never will be until the tribulation period. God said here by a sovereign decree that these things will always be. And these are an example and a sample of the veracity of God. In other words, God has used these things, the sun and the moon and the stars, as a Remind the summer coming next year. We never even bother to think of these things. We just like we just know they're going to be there, right? I mean, we'd be stupid to really worry about. I wonder if there's going to be a winter this year. Or I wonder. I'm going to I'm going to tremble all night long thinking the sun's not going to come up tomorrow. The earth's going to get cold. We never think of these things. It's taken for granted. And God is through these things reminding us that He spoke this, and it will be, and we can bank on it and count on it. And God has shown His consistency and His faithfulness by having these things faithfully happen every day. Now, let's get an example of God's permissive will. And I'd like to turn to 2 Thessalonians 4, 3. These are just samples. 2 Thessalonians 4, 3. Okay, maybe I read... Second Thessalonians, maybe maybe First Thessalonians four three, right? I'm sorry. Thank you. It says, "For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication and add and add." Right? Now I, I'm not going to you know embarrass everybody, but let's face it: has, has every Christian that ever was a Christian for all time never committed fornication? Well, what happened to God's will? Now the Calvinist will tell you that God has only one will, and that's a sovereign will. Therefore, everything that happens on this earth has happened by the sovereign will of God, including murders, rapes, burglaries, I don't care, you name it, it would happen by the sovereign will of God. And I heard him say it right out of their mouth, me and my brother Tommy. And I asked the guy the same question, he says, yep, murders, rapes, killings, everything, all happens by the sovereign will. In other words, God predetermined that these things should happen. That's the terribleness of that, of that doctrine. But the whole point is, we see here that it says, it's not, it says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Has every Christian always abstained from fornication? No. But what happened to the sovereign will of God? It wasn't the sovereign will of God. It was the permissive will of God. And there are two Greek words, I'm not too familiar with them. One is bole and the other is something else, and one means desire. It said, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And a Calvinist will jump right at you and say, you mean that all are saved? No, that it, that, what, that it can't be God's will. He means all the elect. But what the word is saying is that God desires that all men should be saved and come out to the knowledge of the truth. So there is a difference between God's sovereign will and God's permissive will. God will want certain things to be done and command certain things to be done and say to do certain things knowing that they're going to be broken and they will be broken and we suffer the consequences. But there are certain things that God has taken the reins and said it will be and it will be and nothing in high heaven or hell beneath or wherever it may be can stop that from happening. Nothing could stop it from happening. It will happen exactly as God said it. That's his sovereign will. But God has chosen to act a dual aspect and have a permissive will. God has told us certain things he desires, but he is not absolutely forcing or predestinating them to happen. And that's why I've drawn this. There are certain things that could have been, but weren't. Because God did not 
affect the free will of the agents he was working upon, but he did know the beginning from the end. So there is a difference between God's free will or God's sovereign will and God's permissive will. And these scriptures substantiate it. Now, all I brought that up for, and real quickly to bring this up to this, God has and is permitting the creature Satan to rule over the planet Earth because sin will be allowed to run its full course to exhaustion. Then, whenever chronologically that will be, God will be completely vindicated from any wrongdoing. He will have shown his perfect and absolute justice in utterly destroying this entire cosmos. 2 Peter 3.10 And the wicked with it, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9, with everlasting destruction. You can look them up later if you'd like. At the culmination of the total inability of sin to repudiate the holiness of God, God will judge the cosmos and condemn it and take over direct control for time and eternity. Now let me read you one scripture before I elaborate. Isaiah chapter 5 and verses 1 to 7. Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. This is, uh, it's actually a song, and it's a song put to a parable. It says, Now I will sing to my beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he dug it and gathered out the stones and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press in it. And he looked for it to bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I looked for it to bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be eaten up, and break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. And I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for justice, but behold oppression, for righteousness, but behold a cry. What I'm trying to say to you is that when all things have run its full course that God has allowed, namely sin, for some unexplainable reason, sin, not unexplainable, we're going to explain a little bit about sin coming into the universe as much as we can, but for some reason known only to God, God has chosen rather than to stop sin when it began to allow it to run its full course until final exhaustion. At the end of sin, of being allowed to run its full course, God will be completely vindicated from any injustice, wrongdoing, or whatever, and that this creature Satan will come before God and bow before him, and he will be, embarrassed, be embarrassingly thrown into the lake of fire, and he and his angels will not have one voice to say about the whole thing. They will be completely mouth-stopped. I don't know if we understand what that scripture means, all the world shall become guilty before God and every mouth shall be stopped. That means that Satan will stand before God and he will have no more what-ifs or but-ands or anything to say to God. His mouth will be completely silenced for once and for all, and every wicked person and every angel that follows Satan will stand before God and not be able to say one word in defense of their actions. They will be completely shown for time and eternity that they were totally wrong. And they will be so embarrassed and so shown that they're wrong that they won't even be able to open their mouth in defense of themselves, but they will almost walk into the lake of fire without even being thrown in. That's how God will show them through the why he's allowed this evil to run its course. Because God will never be accused. There will be nobody in hell saying, if only I had 
or if it could have been, but if or what if, none of them will be able to say that they will be in that lake of fire and they will know that they justly belong there. And they will have no complaint to God for being in that lake of fire. That's how clear God is going to prove and vindicate his holiness. And that's why God has allowed sin and Satan to take over his cosmos and to run his course. I just want to go on with this a little bit. God has allowed Satan control over earth, but he intervenes at points in the affairs of men. And this is another important thing. This is what I tried to show before. We mustn't get the picture also that Satan controls the entire cosmos, which he does, and then that's it. And we're just helpless under his control. God does intervene in the affairs of men and the planet at intervals saved and unsaved alike but he does it all without violating the scenario or the experiment that he's allowed satan to run he does it in a way that he does not actually how would i say it like if satan was going to do something to somebody god doesn't miraculously do something with that individual so satan is infinite in doing what he's going to do by using by uh, uh, violating the free will of this person God does everything he's doing, working through the circumstances, intervening in the affair without violating the experiment or the scenario that he set forth before Satan. Else Satan could say to him, well, that wasn't fair. My goodness, after all, you said, I said if I could do this to this guy, that he's going to do something against you, and I start to do it, and you zap him with super strength. That was no experiment at all. You see, it's not like that. I can't explain all the mechanics of it. But God has so designed and allowed sin to run its course that he will not violate his holiness nor tamper with the course of sin except, I would say, in a way that is fair. And then when sin has run its full course, not being, no one saying, well, God, you stemmed it here or you did this or you did that unfairly, then the creatures would have something to accuse God before. He will not do it in that way. And this, again, I'll explain more specifically when we get into our specifics with this thing. One last thing I'd like to read you about Satan's character by Dr. William Cook. I don't agree with his end part, but I agree with most everything else he says here. And I'll read this and we'll wind this up with a few short captions. <clears throat> Dr. William Cook, in his Christian Theology, pages 631 and 632, speaks of the true character of the devil. The law of dependency is universal because God alone is the fountain of all being and of all good. Every creature, however high in the scale of existence, is dependent upon God, not only for its being, but for its goodness, and therefore its goodness or holiness can be perpetuated only by union with him. Sin severs the soul from God, and severed from him, the soul is deprived of his favor and his strength to uphold it in virtue and goodness. And deprived of his favor and sustaining power, it is thrown upon itself and becomes actuated by its own selfish instinct. And as selfishness becomes intensified, there is no sin, however deep in guilt and malignity, that may not grow out of it. Such has been the direct effect of the apostasy of angels. The selfishness which engendered the first sin has, during the lapse of ages, produced and developed every malignant principle which now so darkly stains their condition. Hatred of God produces hatred of all good, of all good in itself and of all beings that are good, and of envy at their happiness. From hatred and envy springs the desire to corrupt whatever is good and destroy whatever is happy. This desire seeks its end by stratagem, deceit, and all available means within reach. The arch fiend is called Satan which means an adversary, the old serpent because of his guile, a liar, a liar from the beginning, the father of lies. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. He is called Apollyon, which means destroyer, because he delights in destroying the souls of men and goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Not only is he a destroyer, but a murderer, a murderer of both of bodies and souls. All his arts of seduction have a murder as his ultimate object. All the sin and misery of our world for 6,000 years 
and all the sin and misery of its future history and all the misery of hell is not only the result of his agency and influence, but results in which he and his minions find in their gratification. Now, I agree with everything this brother said except the last part. Satan is not entirely responsible for all the sin and misery in this earth. Man shares that responsibility. Now, I don't know if he meant that. I think what he really meant was Satan is really the one that motivated or instituted uh, the things that brought about this, this stuff, all the ruin of the ages for the years. He may mean that. But to mean that Satan alone is responsible would be for an un regenerate sinner to stand before God at the judgment seat and say, what can I do about it? The creature you created brought all this to bear, and what kind of what force did I have against him? He, he ruled everything, he controlled everything, he called the shots and I danced to the tune. What could I do? And now you're going to throw me in hell? And that's justice? And would not God be embarrassed? Certainly. Man is, not, is responsible for his own destiny. Satan has actually set the stage, and this is what we got to learn. He is controlling and pulling the strings of this planet Earth, but man is not helpless under this control. Man has an option. He has a choice to make, a free will choice to make of his own will that Satan cannot coerce in such a way that the man is incapable of responding. Nor is he coerced in such a way by God that he must respond. But he has given all the facts, all the figures, the mentality to evaluate it, and the capability of making a responsible choice. And there is where the crux of it all is, and he makes the determination. God has provided the salvation. God has done everything. Man has done nothing to deserve it, provide it, attain it, or anything. God simply lays it before the man and says, here it is. But the man must choose to take it. <coughs> now, I just want to end up with this. In the next study I do, which will be the study proper, I'm going to deal with part number two, which deals with health. And I'm going to get into the more specifics. But I want you to get the idea for now, what I try to lay the groundwork was this. Satan influences and controls this entire planet. God does not rule it. But they're not fighting to see who's going to win, because if that were the case, God would win it in one split second with one word. God has allowed Satan control with limitations. And the limitations are the times when God will come down and do something either by another man, an angel, or some miraculous manifestation, just to say, remember, Satan, you broke rule number five. You can't go down to exit A. There are other times, and God is playing according to the rules, and it's not a game. I should say it's a deadly scenario. Not a game, but it's almost played like a game. And the only time God intervenes is when Satan would overstep the agreement, which... God says, you have been given all things necessary to show and to make your points. The things that you would do beyond that are not only non-necessary, but they are also that wrong that it would not be contrived with what God has said should take place. Other words, Satan would like to do some things on the side. He has been given a free reign to prove his point. But what this brother Cook brought out is his hatred for all that is good and those that are good and all that call upon God or would call upon God, he is so vindictive and so fiendish that he wants to destroy man. He hates you. Your arch enemy is Satan. He hates you with a holy hatred almost, if I could use that phrase. He would love nothing better than to see man in eternal torment. He hates mankind. He hates anything that was created of God that is good or right. And if he along the way could knock over a few bushes or trample on a few flowers, that's exactly what he's going to do. He would go out of his way to do this. And that's when God steps in and says, no, that's not part of the game. That's not necessary. You can't go down this way. It's not needful to prove your point. And that's when God interferes. And we're going to, when we get into the specifics, we're going to see exactly what that means.
Now, I hope that this has not been a total confusion. This has all been just introduction to I get into the main things, <coughs> points one to five in the next series. So we'll close with the word of prayer and have a time of questions, okay?